Hello, welcome to Amnesty International UK's live web chat. We're here with Robert King. We're here in Shoreditch, London on this beautiful sunny day for this very special live web chat. We've been taking questions from people over the last couple of days and we hope to get some more from you over the next hour. So please do tweet or Facebook in any questions for Robert. Robert King is the only freed member of the Angola Three, released in 2001 after spending 29 years in solitary confinement. That's 29 years in a room, two metres by three metres, for 23 hours per day. Solitary confinement, isolation, closed cell restrictive units, whatever name you give to this system, it is solitary confinement. Robert was held in solitary along with Herman Wallace and Albert Woodfox. Together, the men became known as the Angola Three. Angola Prison in Louisiana was built on a former slave plantation. During the 1970s, it was one of the most brutal prisons in the USA. Inmate murder and rape were commonplace, and sexual slavery and racism were entrenched in inmate culture. Uh, Albert and Herman founded the prison chapter of the Black Panther Party to combat these conditions and to campaign for racial solidarity between inmates. In 1973, Albert Woodfox and Herman Wallace were found guilty of the 1972 murder of prison officer Brent Miller. Both men have continually maintained their innocence. No physical evidence links them to the crime, potentially exculpatory evidence was lost, and over the years evidence has emerged that the only eyewitness to the crime was bribed by prison officials to give testimony against Herman and Albert. Albert's conviction has recently been overturned for the third time, this time on the grounds of racial discrimination in the selection of the grand jury foreperson. The state of Louisiana has indicated that they will appeal this, this ruling and Albert remains in isolation. In 2006, the State Judicial Commission recommended that Herman's conviction too be reversed. However, the Louisiana Supreme Court rejected this recommendation and denied his appeal without comment. His case is now before the federal courts. Herman too remains in isolation 41 years later. Four decades later, and all three men are still fighting for justice and for recognition of the cruelty of their years in solitary confinement. Since his release in 2001, Robert King has dedicated his life to the continuing struggle. Robert, welcome to Amnesty UK. Thank you. My first question for you, Robert, is in 2008, Brent Miller's widow, Teeny Verrett, said about Herman and Albert, if they did not do this, and I believe that they didn't, they have been living a nightmare for 36 years. Robert, why, after 41 years, are the state of Louisiana seemingly so determined to continue what can only be described as injustice compounded by keeping Herman and Albert in solitary? Well, thank you for the question and thank you for being here. Um, I believe the reason why Herman and Albert remain in prison in solitary confinement is because their conviction were based uh, solely on unreliable evidence. Uh, there were young, eager attorneys at the time. I'm talking about John St. Field, who initially prosecuted um, Albert, and he went on to become Attorney General of the state of Louisiana. And his career, I read the transcript in Albert's trial. It was riddled with um, inaccuracies and inference of his uh, so-called activism and pantherism. Uh, he was referred to as animalistic and a lot of other things. These are the things that was in his transcript. He was referred to as a fox, a wolf, or whatever you want to call him. Uh, but they see him as being a panther. And as a result, uh, uh, careers has been made off, off of this because John St. Field uh, went on to become a full-fledged attorney general of the state of Louisiana. And I believe his uh, the decision to try Albert as a Black Panther and to maintain that Albert was guilty, despite the fact that there was no evidence linking him to the crime except paid a testimony, uh, I feel is that uh, he feels that uh, his only uh, validation, the fact that his accreditation as a becoming an attorney general and a prosecute a career prosecutor attorney, I think it is validated with his insistence that Albert is guilty despite the fact that all evidence has been undermined. He insists that Albert and Herman are guilty in the face of no evidence. 
Robert, you spent 29 years in solitary confinement. Hamlin and Albert have spent 41 years in solitary confinement. Could you just tell us what solitary confinement is? Uh, yes, well, you know, solitary confinement is, is, is defined as being according to courts and the federal courts and state courts. If a person is uh, locked in a cell 23 hours a day in a cell, no bigger than the closet, it, um, his, his or her restrictions are very limited. All of this constitutes a solitary confinement. Of course, <laughs> we have Buddy Caldwell. He has somehow his own definition for what constitutes solitary confinement. But he is not uh, an individual. He don't have that right. Uh, nor is he the entity who defines what constitutes solitary confinement. All federal codes, state codes, and the code in America has defined solitary confinement just as I uh, said it was, being held in uh, confinement, isolation of 23 hours a day for whatever amount of time, whether it's 15 days or whether it's 15 years, uh, it's still solitary confinement. So just, just to be clear for, for people that are watching, we, we're talking about 23 hours of 24 hours in a day in a cell mm -hmm. alone. One hour out of the cell for recreation, is that alone as well? Uh, yes. Uh, when you go on the yard, you are placed on the yard in a sort of like, they call it a bullpen or they call it whatever you want to. Uh, they got many names for it, but uh, usually a, a place that is uh, probably uh, no bigger than about maybe 30 yards along a walkway, constitutes sort of like a walkway, and you are there uh, alone. Uh, you don't come in contact. Of course, there are several fences the way it got it situated there part it off in Angola and there are sev several fences and they have one guy on one yard, another guy on another yard, another guy, individual gates mm -hmm. and so forth. And how did you cope? How did you cope with 29 years in those conditions? Well, <laughs> well, you, you, you have no, no, no choice really. You, I think you have to quote, after all, you know, um, they had placed me in solitary confinement without uh, any legitimate or penological reason. Uh, I understood the connection. I knew that he, I was being placed in solitary confinement uh, based on my belief, which at the time I was a member of the Black Panther Party and we were struggling against conditions. I joined Hummer and Alpha to struggle against these conditions. So they placed me in, um, in solitary, and I knew why I was being placed in solitary confinement. So with this, um, my mindset, I had a change of mindset. I understood that why what was happening to me. And, you know, it was sort of like, you know, when you could define and uh, you know dissect and analyze the reason as to why things are happening, then I imagine you. I, this helped me in an event to cope with what I was dealing with because I felt the need to do something about it. And in order to do this, I I had to maintain some semblance of uh, sanity. I had to be able to cope some coping mechanism, and I did this through exercising and through reading and. Um, thinking, I used to love to think. I uh, got very little sleep because it was kind of hard to sleep because they come through the, the building and every half hour, if you were asleep, um, they clang or bang the door shut. So you have to allow yourself to to adjust to to being able to sleep when when you can. So you learn to you learn to cope with it. And I mean, it's a you know, it's it's not uh, the the coping me mechanism that would work for everyone else, but it worked for me at that time. Well, I'm going to um, take some questions that we've had on social media over the last couple of days. The first one is from Emma, who sent in a question from Facebook. She says, Robert, she remembers you saying that you read every day in solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. What was the most important book you feel you read? Wow. Well, um, I do believe that there were many books that were you know, important because, you know, I, I, I consider myself sort of what they call it, e e e eclectic. Uh, they, uh, I, I, I got a little from, oh, but well, there were some books that I've, that I've read that I think I got more out, uh, uh, more of a perspective than others. And um, Richard Wright was one of my favorite editors. Richard Wright, uh, he wrote, he written a book, uh, um, the character was Bigger Thomas, but it was a native son, that is the name of the book, and it was his writing style that I was really infatuated, I fell in love with it. But of course, Frederick Douglass was another writer. Once I read the, 
um, the writing of Frederick Douglass, but then George Jackson, you come on up to a more modern time. I mean, I read all of the, all of the, all of the books. I read a lot of philosophy books. I read <laughs> Marx, Lenin, Engels, Mao. I read lots of books. At that time, they were available during a period of time, you know, to us. Of course, over the years, they've taken those books away. Uh, a lot of the, the books that we uh, were allowed to have at that period, they're in the library now. Mm -hmm. But at that time, they were, we had access to them because at the time, I didn't realize what type of book it was. Keeping on a, keeping on a, similar, seat, a similar theme, we've got a question from Amy, um, who says, spending so much time in isolation must have been so hard. What were the particular thoughts that kept you strong for those 29 years? Well, the fact that, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was innocent and I understood why I was being in solitary confinement. So I think these, uh, the fact that I was innocent and I had to maintain um, my belief that at some point, even though I knew I could die in prison, I believed that I would eventually get out of prison. I thought that I, I felt that I would get out of prison, and I felt that in order to get out of prison, I needed to maintain, you know, I needed to know a little about the law, I needed to maintain maintain some sanity, I, even though I was locked in solitary confinement, and I saw what was happening with people who come in uh, after a period of time, uh, they started redressing to uh, what people might uh, succumb into, what people might come some some inability uh, to communicate or socialize with people. I didn't want to uh, become that way um, because I saw what happened to people. Um, they become sort of like reclusive uh, within a reclusive environment. Mm. And we've had a, a, about two or three questions on Facebook along a similar theme, um, which is to ask you how you kept your sanity and hope for so long. <laughs> well, you know, I always say this. Uh, I, I, I take pride in the fact that I, I kind of reflect some sanity, but you know, uh, it's kind of hard to, uh, to get dipped in waste and not come up smelling, you know. Uh, so when people ask me, why aren't you insane, I, I let them know, hold up, I didn't say I wasn't insane. You know, you can't get dipped in waste and not come up smelling. We've got a question, another question from Bexy, who asks, in the 29 years that you were in, soli in solitary for, what did you feel had changed? Do you feel as if your suffering has changed, and, and in what way? Um, I can't say the, the suffering has changed. Um, I can say this, that being in that position uh, did not impact me um, as it you know, did initially, I think the more, you don't become inured to the environment, but you become acclimated mm -hmm. to it to a degree so you could kind of tolerate it and you could put up with it. So uh, I was able to m perhaps, instead of be being inured, I was acclimated to, to where I was because I became acclimated to short distances and, and my eyes proved that because for a while my eyes would only see outside of this uh, a perimeter that was about nine by nine. Of course, my cell wasn't that big. My Jesus. cell was a six by nine by 12, but I couldn't see after about seven years, uh, my eyes had deteriorated to the point that I couldn't see outside of a perimeter of perhaps nine by nine. If I didn't recognize the person's voice, I could not uh, recognize the face. So what you mentioned that your eyesight deteriorated. Um, what other health concerns did you have upon release? Um, well, you know, that there are, you know, high blood pressure, the usual that come with um no no major major thing, anything like that, but um I do take medication for high blood pressure and that was something that that a condition that, that aroused, but there were other um uh, uh you know, condition that that, that that came up too and uh, I was able to cope with those. Mm. So. And those were um exacerbated by your years in solitary confinement? Uh, of course, um, everything is exacerbated, especially in solitary mm -hmm. confinement. Mm -hmm. So um, matters are automatically made worse, or worse, and you know, by the mere fact of being in solitary mm -hmm. confinement. Mm -hmm. We've got a question from Ruth here, and she asks, um, "What was the first thing you did when you were released from solitary confinement, Robert?" Well, my release from solitary confinement was my release from prison mm -hmm. uh, after thirty-one years. So. Uh, 
when I walked out the gate, I walked out the gate into the midst of a group of supporters who had stayed behind, who had came to trial, had came to court that day, and, and who had the decision of, uh, that I would be uh, that I would be freed on what they call a, a 1201 uh, after midnight. That's when they were supposed to release me. But the supporters uh, who came to court that day, they decided to wait outside the gate, uh, and they would have waited. Uh, till one minute after 12 midnight, but it so happened uh, there was a glitch in the computer and they realized that they had miscalculated my time and that I was really overdue. So they gave a call uh, to the prison to say that I would be released immediately. And I was released that day and I was released into the hands of a, uh, well, into the midst of a group of people and we took the highway and um, yeah, we got on the highway and, and uh, we stopped off at a restaurant and uh, I, I didn't have what I thought I probably would have the first thing that I have. I, I thought I, I didn't really didn't have that. I, I think I chose, a, a, for eatery is concerned, I chose a roast beef sandwich, um, which was something that I, I really wanted some kind of seafood, but I opted for a roast beef sandwich. But the main thing I wanted was um, a lemon and I got that the next day, I think. And the reason why I wanted this lemon was because I had been in solitary confinement. I had been in prison really 31 years, and I, had, I hadn't I had seen a lemon. Uh, I had sold bananas and maybe apple uh, twice a year once they give uh, during Christmas and Thanksgiving or something like that. You would get fruit or something like that. But a lemon was something I, I, I hadn't seen, and I, I wanted a lemon. I used to think about it when I was a kid. I used to think about taking a, uh, a lemon and putting a hole in it and then taking a small, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the peppermint sticks, peppermint sticks and jiggle them in and I like the sweet sour taste of lemon. So I wanted that when I got out. And of course, uh, since you have been released from prison, Robert, you really have dedicated your life to the struggle, not only against solitary confinement, but also on behalf of your friends, Herman and Albert. So to return to Herman and Albert, and we know that Albert's conviction has been overturned for the third time on the grounds of uh, racial discrimination in the selection of the grand mm -hmm. jury person, a uh, full person. The state of Louisiana have said that they will appeal that. Amnesty International members in their thousands around the world, and many thousands of you in the UK, so thank you very much for taking action, have been emailing the state um, attorney general, James Buddy Caldwell, urging him not to mm -hmm. appeal the conviction. Uh, have, have you spoken to Herman and Albert recently, and how, how, how are they? Do they know of the campaign that's happening for them on the outside at the moment? Uh, yes. Um, I spoke to, to Albert more, more recently than Herman. Herman maybe a month ago, I, I imagine. But Albert sort of like weeks ago. And I think they, they understand the magnitude of the campaign that is on, ongoing on, on, on their behalf. And they, um, they really asked me to... to to you know, to, to to show their admiration to the folks who are out here doing the work, uh, they they tell me are always they are humble, and you know, and they're really, you know, really delighted that there are so many people who are on board, who have gotten on board, and who are persistent, and who have taken up the cause of A3 because they realize um, that you know. Um, they're just a the tip of the iceberg. There are so many people, and even in Louisiana, who are in the same condition that they are. So they are delighted mm -hmm. uh, that there are people in Amnesty. They have they just don't have enough accolades for Amnesty International and Amnesty uh, USA. And I'm not just saying that to be saying it. It's the truth. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Robert. Well, we've had lots of questions asking what people can do next to assist with the campaign. Obviously, you can go to amnesty.org.uk forward slash Angola3, where you can take action. You can send an email direct to James Caldwell, the Attorney General of the State of Louisiana, and urge him not to appeal the overturning of Albert's conviction. And many questions that we've had, Robert, is what else can people do? Well, I think people should continue, you know, to be persistent. You know, people always ask me, well, oh, you know, what, what can I do? I think the impact that people are already having uh, the fact that they are being persistent in, in, in showing their ongoing support for Albert, I, I, I think this is, I, I think this is, the, we need to continue uh, to do this. You know, uh, people sort of wonder uh, why 
I mean, and we could take an example from, and this is not a validation of Coca-Cola or anything like that, but if you look at Coca-Cola product, I mean, they sell billions of dollars every day, but they are consistent and persistent in their advertisement. They advertise daily. Bear Aspen, which I am a lover of, I take Bear Aspens, but they also sell billions of aspirins a day, but they continue to advertise. So I think we have to do the same thing. Uh, the more you hear, I mean, you throw a pebble in a pond, you get ripples, and the ripples turn to waves. So uh, we're hoping that the descent and the outgoing support of the people become a tidal wave, enough to wash uh, the likes of Buddy Caldwell and his ideology, um, you know, his, his failed ideology about Herman and Albert away. So, um, Robert, as well as the criminal appeals that Herman and Albert have running, there's also a civil case, which is uh, the mm -hmm. state of Louisiana versus Yangoda III, um, to argue that um, continued incarceration in solitary confinement is cruel and unusual punishment. Can you give us an update on that? I think that's been fi was filed in 2000. Is that correct? Well, yes, we left the the, the prison because. <clears throat> Excuse me. Initially, we had to do an ARP, which was an administrative remedy procedure, and this was done sometime in 1998. However, it took a couple of years for us to exhaust um, those remedies and go outside the state. So we can save now for about 13, between 13 and 15 years. Um, the case has been has been has been pending, and we we are we are. We are you know, we are hoping that maybe sometime in um, in the fall that uh, the court will eventually, you know, hear this case because this case that's been pending and, um, you know, the magistrate in the case uh, issued a ruling many, many years ago and, and qualified the fact that, you know, my 29 years in solitary confinement um, constituted cruel and unusual punishment. So what this says to Herman and Albert now, 41 years in solitary confinement. And uh, at that time, we all were, had did 29 years in solitary confinement. So uh, their condition uh, is, I mean, it's, it's perpetual. And, and despite the fact that this ruling has been adjured, uh, they remain in solitary confinement. But we can attribute this also to Buddy Caldwell. A buddy Caldwell, who has also taken, and I use that in literally, he has taken control of the civil case as well, um, and you know uh, he has taken he has uh, taken control of this case uh, as well as the criminal case for some reason. And to me, it's a conflict of interest, and it should not be. But the fact is, uh, he has taken control of it, and 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 this is the reason why I think uh, we see this in impediment. Uh, we see the impediment in the civil case, and we see the same impediment in the criminal case, and the same person that who impedes the criminal impedes the, the civil case. And so the answer is Buddy Caldwell, for some reason, he is vindictive, and he, he you know, for some reason, he feels um, that I, I have no idea, of course, with, except the fact that he and... Uh, uh, John Sankerfield was boyhood friend. They were buddies, uh, and John Sankerfield was a person who um, prosecuted Albert initially as a young attorney. Uh, Buddy Caldwell inherited uh, the job of a uh, attorney general, and he, his assistant became John Sankerfield, and uh, and the uh, other eventual person who prosecuted Albert, Julie Cullen, when Albert appeal was overturned for. I think the first time, or the, maybe the second. Anyway, she decided to, uh, she was an attorney general, also a good friend of uh, uh, John Sinkfield and Buddy Caldwell, and she decided to try Albert or retry Albert as a Black Panther. And so you see this conglomeration of people, you know, that has an interest in this case. Um, uh, and you, you have to think and feel that uh, uh, they're, they're still seeking validation. And, but they're doing this at the expense of Herman and Albert first and foremost, and most of all, uh, at the expense of the taxpayers in Louisiana who have spent millions and millions of dollars on this case, on a case that all of evidence has been undermined. Well, we're getting lots of questions in on our social network, so keep sending them in um, for anyone that's watching now. Um, 
Robert, we've had a question that asks you to describe Angola prison when you first arrived there. Were the prison authorities threatened by your politics? I think so, yes. Uh, uh, if you're asking uh, during the time that they felt that when during the 70s when Herman and then Albert and myself and we were all sent to, to prison, of course they felt they felt threatened. Um, but they were, anytime there were any type of, um, you know, activity or, or active individuals who were trying to change uh, some of the condition in prison, um, prison officials f feel threatened because, you know, um, they, f you know, um, prison, uh, they feel mm, that they have total, not just access over prisoners, but total control, and they control their movement and their action. And if they could, you know, at one time in prison, uh, years ago, uh, prisoners had to win the right to even file a suit. Uh, this is how much control um, prison had over uh, individuals at that time, and they still have the same amount of um, control over prisoners. They can 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 keep them uh, isolated from each other. They can keep. They can maintain. Um, they they can maintain what they call control over their entire uh, the prison itself. But in order to man, contr maintain control over the prisoners, they have to maintain control over the individuals and the prisoners. And you first met Herman and Albert when you were in solitary confinement in Angola. How did you develop and um, continue a friendship while in isolation? Uh, well, you know, I I knew, I met Albert sometime in 1965, never knew him out in the streets, but I met him, you know, when he was had, went, uh, was in prison for his time, I met Albert. And I met Herman also, Herman around, I met Albert sometime in 65 and I met Herman in 66. Um, Herman was continually in prison in 66, Albert by that time uh, had uh, been released and he had went home um, and he was back in prison and so but anyway I had uh, we ended up being back in solitary confinement or in prison together because when they trans when they brought Albert back Albert uh, was arrested in 69 and he went to New York uh, and he was he escaped and went to New York and he was brought back to Louisiana and he was placed um, in, a, in an area that was close to me. It, we weren't on a tier together, but he was in an area close to where I was or where they kept militants, or what they call keeping militants. And it was at that time, once I got to prison, however, uh, in 1972, uh, we ended up on a, on a, on a flat together, uh, he and I, uh, because by this time he had been arrested while in prison and charged with uh, participating in the murder of Mr. Miller and they had locked him up, and so they placed me in the same environment in which they placed Albert, uh, even though I was 150 miles away at the time, and I had never met Mr. Miller, but they decided, since I was a member of the Black Panther Party, or since I was involved in trying to change condition in prison, then I should be isolated as well. It's a very interesting question we've had from Nina on Facebook. She says, I heard you made sweets in prison. How did you do this and why? Ah, well, well, you know, sometimes you, you, if you're able to do, you know, get away with something, that wasn't legal. I want you to know it, it, it really wasn't legal to do that. Uh, but we found a way, you sort of supplement things. We found a way to use, uh, uh, we were allowed to get like uh, cold drink cans, sort of like uh, Coca-Cola cans, which are aluminum. And during breakfast, we get milk, we get butter, we get sugar, and so... Uh, it was a, something that started out really as a, as a sweet, a confession that uh, we were, weren't able to get pecans, even though there are lots of pecan trees uh, in Angola. Uh, if you go to the commissary, you're able to get uh, peanuts. So I, I started out making peanuts. Not peanut brittle, but peanut sort of like fudge. And, and, and I sort of perfected it. Um, um, I started making it in prison. and. Guys used to love it. I used to make them give it to, especially some of the guys on that row. But most of the guys at CCR and so forth. And uh, because it was something that, you know, uh, we didn't get. It was a luxury. And some of us probably would never uh, ever see that kind of candy again. So I decided to, to kind of make life a little sweeter while I was in prison for <laughs> people. And I, since I've been out, I kind of make it a little sweeter for people as well because I still make the candy. 
So we've got a lot of questions around the things that you couldn't do in CCR, and this one is one that I think is very interesting. Um, we've been asked if you could listen to music at all when you're in prison, and if yes, what was your favourite music or song? And if no, what's your favourite music or song? Well, we were allowed to uh, listen to music because uh, with, with radios, with some guys, even though at the time we didn't have television, and television came later after filing and, and you know, from having access to media, but there was a grandfather clause that seemed to have come with having a radio if you could afford it. And if you could afford a radio, they allowed you to have a radio. Um, my favorite music was, you know, I, I think the, the the 60s and the, especially the 70s, there it was a lot of good songs across the board, good songs that that, that was released. Um, but you know, I'm still old school. And um, I think one of my favorite songs, you know, probably, and my favorite singer uh, would be Sam Cooke without a doubt. But my, one of my favorite songs would be Isaac Hayes, I'm standing accused of loving somebody, you know. <laughs> Well, you, you, you've also written a book, Robert, which will uh, give you information um, about at the end of this web chat and how you can buy a copy of that. Um, but did you write this in prison or, or when you were released? Oh, no, no. It was all done in prison and thought about in prison. And it was a, a lot of other writing that I didn't even think about publishing and for wouldn't even think about publishing. It was, <laughs> but I did a lot of writing and all that was done in, in prison. Um, yeah, of course... Uh, the last edition of the book, um, the paperback, um, I sort of revised some of the thing and implemented some new stuff. For instance, like um, that was Troy Davis was executed. Um, during, I was in Philadelphia, uh, Pittsburgh that night and speaking to a group of people when he was um, um, executed. <clears throat> but uh, prior to being released, I had also written a a piece on Shaka Sankova, the state of Texas, killed him sometime, I think in two, what it was, maybe 2000. And uh, it was obvious he was innocent. And I wanted that in the book. That should have been in the first, the hardcover. But the publishers, uh, um, the publisher, they wanted to print the book in a hurry and, and told me I would be able to kick it in in the next edition, which was the paperback. And so what I did, I kind of, um, you know, um, put all together. I, I made the uh, spoke, made the, the loop or the track from um, Shaka Sankova to Troy Davis and all in between and beyond that. So it gave me a chance to kind of make the connection between, you know, you know, uh, death sentences and also speak more about uh, long term sentences, which is incremental death. Uh, you don't have to have a, the death sentence, but you could have a life or sentence that is so long, it becomes a death sentence because it's incremental. You cannot do uh, incremental a life sentence. You know I mean, because a life means life. We've had a lot of questions about what people can do next. And, and again, just to remind people, if you go to amnesty.org.uk forward slash Angola 3, you can email James Buddy Caldwell, the, uh, the Attorney General of the State of Louisiana, and urge him not to appeal um, the overturning, the third overturning of Albert Wood Fox's conviction. But some questions, Robert, around what do you think international pressure can do from organisations like Amnesty? Do you think this works and why? Yes, again, I, of course I think it, it works uh, because it's the persistence of that gone, ongoing and the fact that um, um, a while, a few weeks ago, I think as a result of Amnesty's input um, and, and because of the petition that was, you know, orchestrated and, uh, by Amnesty, uh, it prompted Buddy Caldwell to, to, to say things. Um, and it, and the thing that that he said and did, it, it, I don't think it took. I mean, anyone listening to his unreasonable, you know, uh, uh, assessment of the case uh, will determine that uh, that this guy is flawed. That um, why is he um, persistent? Why is he prosecuting or litigating this case? Um, 
because the, the thing that he said to me doesn't make any rational sense with regards to Albert, um, you know, being guilty and so forth. Uh, it prompted this, and that, and that is something that, you know, uh, it just doesn't make it just doesn't make sense. The rationale that he gave, and I can give it to you if you want. The reason why I feel is that I wasn't able to do if. Albert would have had these prior, this, this, these uh, charges on him in 1969 when he was arrested. Bet your bottom top and middle dollar, Albert being a prior defendant, having a, and according to Buddy Caldwell, a career criminal, Albert would have received, he would have been charged. The greater crime, which at that time, uh, Buddy Caldwell had alluded to this some uh, three years ago. He came back with it again, as some rape charge. Albert has never been convicted of rape. He has never been charged with rape. There is none of, of this on his record. But Buddy Caldwell insists that he had a rape charge, or he had multiple rape charges. That he is the worst person on the planet. And if that is the case. Albert would have been tried, and they would have convicted him for this rape in 1969, and he would have received, no doubt, it was mandatory that the death sentence, get this, uh, in the United States. It wasn't until 1972 in a Farmer v. Georgia ruling that put a moratorium on the death sentence. And that is the, and, 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 uh, but other than that, Albert would have been convicted three years ago and he would have been on death row according if Buddy Caldwell assessment is right. But again, Buddy Caldwell assessment is all wrong. Uh, Albert was never charged. Uh, he was, um, and if he was ever accused of rape, every black man arrested during that period, uh, if there was a charge that was open and unsolved, they became suspect. And Albert was no different. Well, Robert, I know that you're never going to give up in this campaign. Your tenacity and your dignity and your strength are truly humbling and an inspiration for all of us. So what is your hope for the future? Do you think Herman and Albert will walk free? Um, yes, I, I do believe that Herman and Albert will, despite all of the impediments and, you know, the hills and the time, I think Herman and I will ultimately uh, uh, be free. I think, um, I do believe this, that um, the court will let Albert's conviction stand. This is this is my hope. Uh, this is Albert's hope. This is the campaign hope. And I believe this, that if we continue to be persistent um, in our quest to see him free, I think uh, the, the, the court, you know, there is no such thing as there are some cases that are tried you know, public public uh, opinion plays a, a, a big role sometimes in the mindset of judges who listen to the news as well. So I think we continue to uh, give this support, and I think the judges are here. Um, and, 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 and with this, you know, in our favor, it's sort of like a win at our back. I think Albert and, and Herman both will be pushed from the bowels of prison. We've got just a few more questions left, so we'll just keep going for a few minutes longer, if that's okay, Robert. We've got another question on Facebook here, which has said that you became politically active during your time in Angola, and that's where you first became a member of the Black Panther Party. What did you manage to organise in prison? What did you do? What did your campaigning look like? Well, what we were able to do is, and I, I, I don't... Uh, at, didn't uh, sell myself as you know an organizer, but I thought what we did uh, was kind of encourage, uh, let people you know uh, in 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 prison in solitary confinement in cells, knew that despite the fact that we were in prison that there was still certain uh, inalienable rights that we we had and uh, that we should be able to pursue these. There was something that they could not keep uh, from us, you know, such as you know. Um, uh, visiting and a few other things and um, you know such as uh, giving us the minimal requirement that is you know a daily requirement that is due to make life even in prison sort of uh, help you to maintain some some dignity and this is what we felt that we had to fight for uh, for instance like we uh, there was a, a practice they used to just feed our feed us and put our food on the floor in a tray on the floor and 
it was it was so unsanitary and it was so disgusting and we decided to kind of struggle against this. These are the type of things that we uh, felt that we could have an impact on how we were treated as human beings. And this is what we focus on. Uh, to try to, uh, we petition and we appeal to the administration and we, uh, you know, we rationalize with them. And in some cases, uh, uh, we, we won just through appealing. And in other cases, we have to do uh, a passive protest and where we went on hunger strike and we were able to get the attention and we got some things done that way as well. How long were you on hunger strike for? Well, uh, Albert says at one point we were on hunger strike more than 30 days. Uh, I don't know, uh, it could have been that long, um, but it was, he said 40. It could have been in the 30s. I, 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 you lose count after that, mm. you don't pay any attention because we weren't eating any, anything. I, actually, we were only drinking water. Um, that's that was the left on in our, our cell. There are people who go on hung, hunger strike sometime and they will eat every third day or every other meal. No, we didn't do anything like that. It was raw, straight through. So please do keep sending your questions in. We'll be able to answer some more um, on Facebook later if we don't get to them today. Um, but I've got a quote here from um, the prison, one of the prison wardens, um, Bert Kane, who said of um, Albert, even if he is not guilty of these things, I would not release him from solitary as I would have him running around this prison practicing Black Pantherism. What does that say to you, Robert? Well, it says one thing that that Burr Kane is, is probably as, I don't want to use the term, but Burr Kane is, he's in the same category with Buddy Caldwell in his assessment of Herman and Albert, and I do think one influenced the other. Uh, they both have ne negative impact on each other. Uh, uh, so I think when you, when you hear Buddy, Buddy when you hear uh, Burr Kane, uh, you hear Buddy Caldwell uh, saying these things as well. Well, we've run, we've run out of questions now, so we're going to finish up. But just to let you know that if you do want to learn more about the Angola 3 case, um, you can go again to amnesty.org.uk forward slash Angola 3. We've got reports, briefings, um, lots of information on the case, and that's a place to take action. So please do take action. As Robert has said, international pressure really does work. When we first asked you to take action on behalf of the Angola 3 um, in April of last year, which marked the 40th anniversary of Herman and Albert and Robert first being placed in solitary confinement, over 11,000 of you sent emails to the Department of Corrections urging them to remove Herman and Albert from solitary confinement. We're keeping the action going, we're keeping the pressure up, we're urging James Buddy Caldwell not to appeal the ruling and we really need to keep you with us because the louder, the, the more people we have on our side, the louder our collective voice can be and the more impact and the more effective we can be is a campaign for Herman and Albert. More things that you can do to keep up to date with the campaign is to watch this film, In the Land of the Free, which you can buy on Amazon, I believe, and also Robert's book that we referred to earlier, From the Bottom of the Heap. You can buy this on Amazon too. I've got a signed copy. Thank you very much, Robert. Mm -hmm. I've read it. It's a fantastic book, so everyone should read this. Um, and please, please, please continue to take action um, because we, we really do need to keep the pressure up. 41 years. The 17th of April of this year marked 41 years since Herman and Albert were first placed in solitary confinement. That's 41 years in a cell, 2 metres by 3 metres for 23 hours a day. Robert, I'd like to thank you very much for coming today and finally just to ask you what your hope is for the future after you leave. My hope for the future after I leave this office? Yes. <laughs> for the future going on. Well, well, I guess my hope for the future is, is that I continue to come in contact with folks like Amnesty and, and, uh, yeah, and friends um, of A3. Uh, because again, you know, I'm I'm not I'm passionate about about my commission, and I'm not just looking at A3. I'm looking beyond. There are so many other people who are in the same predicament that we are. So I'm thinking that uh, if people, you know, see our hope realized and personified, then it gives hope to other people as well. And so, 
So my, you know, my, my hope is that we continue to give hope to other people who don't have any hope. And Amnesty has made this possible. Thank you, Robert, and thank you so much for coming. And thanks to everyone that's watched today. And don't forget, one last chance, amnesty.org.uk forward slash Angola 3.